So let me go ahead and get to the right page. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at the Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are very healing to parents throughout the world, and so we do post them on YouTube, just to let you know. So these will be available later as well. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Irene to introduce our three speakers. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, first, we'd like to introduce Dr. Craig Hogan. Our Craig Hogan is the author of Your Eternal Self, as well as a writer and trainer of writer with 38 years experience. He is the director of the Center for Spiritual Understanding and on the boards of the Academy of Spiritual and Paranormal Studies, an association for evaluation and communication of evidence for survival. Judith Hancock's MSW, LCSW, BCETS has been specializing in holistic trauma recovery for over three decades. She has been a yoga, meditation, and philosophy teacher since 1980. Judy practices therapeutic modalities that safely guides us to peace of mind, emotional stability, and strength of spirit. I would also like to add that she is my sister. She is the godmother of my daughter, um, her niece, our angel, Carly Elizabeth Hughes. For more information about these techniques and testimonials, you can visit shiomi.com, judithhancocks.com, and whitewolfcenter.net. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Hogan now, and we will introduce Brian uh, when, when they ask him to speak. Okay, Craig. Craig, you need to unmute. Uh, Elizabeth, can you help me get him on? Got it. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I always enjoy the, speaking with Helping Parents Heal because all of you are so interested and so anxious to find out more of what we know about the this life and the life after this life. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Afterlife Research and Education Institutes. We started the Institutes uh, to help people to connect with loved ones on the other side. So what we're doing is we're helping those who are doing the research to learn how to communicate. And then we're distributing that. We're teaching people how to communicate. We're making marvelous strides in communication. So now at least one method is 98% successful. That's the method that, that Judy's gonna be talking about today. And we know that we can communicate. So what we're doing is we're trying to find financing and we're trying to give support to people who are endeavoring to help others to learn how to communicate. So I wrote a book called Your Eternal Self and I wrote the book because people are largely don't know very much about why, why it is that we know that the afterlife is a reality, why we know that our loved ones are close by and that we can communicate with them. And it shows that the mind is not in the brain. That's the first reason that we know that it's true. And then we know that people are able to communicate and are communicating adeptly now. So it's something that uh, people can learn how to do. And we're doing the training. There's a training program online. It's called Self-Guided Afterlife Connections. And it goes through the process of teaching people how to use self-hypnosis 
to make a connection and it's 86% successful if everybody goes through the training. And it's available free, it's online, and we developed it uh, specifically for people to use. And we have thousands and thousands of people all around the world who are using it. Uh, the address for it is self-guided, period, spiritual understanding, period, org. So self-guided, period, spiritual understanding, period, org. So I'd invite anybody to get on it. And if you had any questions about it, to send me an email. And if you would like some help with it, or if you'd like me to share what happens with you, I'd be delighted to hear from you about what goes on during your, your sessions. Now, I got involved when, in the activities that Judy is involved in now when I was first contacted by a psychotherapist in Libertyville, Illinois. His name was Dr. Al Botkin. He was at the VA hospital there. And Dr. Botkin had learned that his VA clients who were grieving for somebody, it could have been grieving for an enemy soldier they saw killed, or it could be grieving for a buddy that had been lost. But they were grieving for these people, and he was using a method, a therapy method called EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And what this method does is it disrupts the normal working of the mind. Normally, what happens is we have things in the mind compartmentalized. On the right side of the mind, we have things that are intuitive and general, and they're, they're the big ideas. And on the left side of the, of the mind, we have the details. That's the, where the logical, analytical side is. And normally, we keep things in our lives compartmentalized on one side or the other. You know, so your family is on the right, and then uh, all of our work is on the left. And, and we keep them straight by doing that. And what happens in EMDR is that the mind is confused because you're using bilateral stimulation. And that means that stimulating either side of the body, and you can do that by having eye movements, or you can do that with buzzers in each hand, or even tapping on the knees, alternately between the knees. And that disrupts the mind and it, it disrupts the right and left brain. And, and what that happens is that when somebody brings up the image or brings up a trauma, then they have to look at it in a new way because they can't compartmentalize it now. They can't have it in, in part in the right and part in the left. It scrambles it. So the left brain is involved in looking at that that's in the right brain. And as a result of that, then they reassess what it is that's been going on, what, what that trauma is. And they look at it from another point of view, from outside of the trauma. And when they look at it from outside of the trauma, they very often, most often, will see that that, that was just something that happened. And now it's gone, now that it's done. And they say it's like now reading a newspaper article about it, about somebody else's life. And what that's what this method does. And Al Botkin found out that uh, he was having his patients who were veterans actually have uh, the image and, and the conversation with their the person that they are trying to reach, the person they're grieving for. Uh, and he actually had one who was a, a Viet Cong soldier. Uh, he had um, the soldier, the combat veteran, uh, had killed this soldier. He, and he actually saw his face when he was rushing towards him. And he re remembered his face later on in life. And he felt very guilty about the fact that he had killed this young soldier. And he was carrying that guilt and into, into Dr. Botkin's office. And he went through the EMDR the process, and by the end of the process, by the end of one session, then he came out feeling like, well, th that, that person forgives me. That person says it's okay, that, that it's all right, that was war, and things are better now, and, and my life on the other side is very good. And that changed his life. His whole life changed as a result of it. So Al Potkin was just ecstatic about this. He, he had found this new therapy method that was resolving grief and resolving trauma. And at the same time, it's helping people have afterlife communications, which was revolutionary for him. He wasn't into this field at all. And so what he did was he developed a method called induced after death communication. And in induced afternoon communication, the psychotherapist uses the eye movements and helps the client to come into a, a state of mind in which they have an afterlife communication with a person for whom they're grieving. And I co-authored a book with Al about the IADC method. 
So then a psychotherapist in Washington state learned about what Al had been doing. And she then learned how to do the method, how to do the IABC method, and she improved upon it. And her name was Rochelle Wright. Rochelle improved upon the method by having those on the other side take charge. So she's very much uh, into the communication. She realizes that there is a life after this life. And so she was allowing those on the other side to take charge. And that made a big difference in the therapy because when they took charge, then they would lead the person into the state of mind. They would lead them through the process of connecting with them. And then they would take over and they would run the whole thing. They would bring in the images they wanted to bring in. They would bring the messages. They would bring other people in. So the, the person who's sitting in the psychotherapist's office would have the afterlife connection and then their grief, grief resolved. And it went from a high of 10 or 10 plus 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 on a scale of one to 10 to a low of zero to three in one session. And the reason is because they actually had a connection with their loved ones on the other side. So then I co-authored a book with Rochelle as well. So both of those books now are available. They, uh, what Judy is doing is uh, she's doing that, that kind of therapy. Uh, she's limiting it to state, state licensed psychotherapists. And so only people who are qualified and can take over if the person uncovers a trauma, uncovers a difficulty, uh, can handle that because it's uh, one of those things that can break open when you when you scramble the, the sides of the brain, then what you're doing is you're allowing things to come out that were repressed before. And when they're coming out, then they can have some unfortunate consequences. And so the state licensed psychotherapist can handle that. And so that's the reason that she's going to be limiting it to that. And she's done a wonderful job of setting up the training. The training is very exciting. Uh, she's doing it online. Uh, and that will allow many more people to have this experience. And the, the important thing about these experiences is that with every person who has an experience of this kind, it changes humankind a little bit. Every person becomes convinced realizing that we continue to live on and live on very joyously after the, we leave the body, stop using the body. Uh, and that's very important because that's the crux of what makes a difference in people converting the, to understanding that this life is a very short life. It's, it's like going to the dentist. And I uh, say so you have this period and then you walk away and you're and you're free and healthy and clear and, and uh, you can go on with your real life. And the real life is the life that you have after this life. And so that is the message. That's what we're really getting to people when we do things like the guided afterlife connections, the repair and reattachment psychotherapy, which is what Rochelle did and what Judy does. And so this is a ministry. It really is a way of helping people to change their lives, as well as helping them to, to take care of the trauma, helping them to take care of grief, helping them to understand what it is that's going on with them that makes a difference in their lives, that makes them a different person as a result of that. So that's the exciting part, and that's why I, I'm so involved in it and why I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Judy and Brian today. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'll answer any questions. So I guess I'll, I'll just quickly say that um, it'd probably be best to just let Judy go ahead and speak and Brian, and then we can see if people have questions after. I think that mm -hmm. they're probably uh, not realizing they'd have uh, the opportunity so quickly. But I want to say you must have an adorable cat there who's <laughs> wanting oh. your attention. <laughs> was he walking around? <laughs> no, no, no. He was just saying something while you were speaking. Was oh, something. was he? Oh, yeah. But um, let's go ahead and move on to Judy. And then we'll come back to questions after, if that's OK. And thank you so much, Craig. So Judy, you're unmuted. Let's go ahead and have you speak. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to come. And yes, it's always. Um, an honor to be here and, and share about the afterlife. And like Dr. Alan Botkin, um, I did EMDR. I was trained in EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing in like 1995. So in the process of helping people heal from the trauma, and as Craig said, you know, that we work with two sides of the brain. I say it a little differently, you know, with traumatic stress, 
and people may have heard this before, but um, acute traumatic stress, when we first experience an overwhelming traumatic experience, the first 30 days is called acute, the acute period. And usually if it's um, a, a trauma that's not overwhelming, it can be processed normally from the both sides of the brain. You know, the, the flooding of the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere has the emotions and the pictures about it, but no words. And the left hemisphere has the words about it and the pictures, but no emotions. So somehow it has to integrate and there's neurons that go back and forth. And just like when we're walking, we can relax because we're, we're evenly, you know, setting a rhythm for the right and left brain and it kind of brings us into the center. So after the 30 days, um, it can most of the time process that out itself and we're not left with that um, shock and lock. That's kind of a Judaism, you know, I, I, to the shock of this overwhelming trauma and the traumatic event of your child transitioning before you is so overwhelming. We're not, you know, in a place where we we even want to think about that. Never mind have it happen. And so that is an overwhelming trauma, and the shock of it, and the flood of adrenaline, and it just locks into the nervous system and sticks to us. And after 30 days, mm -hmm, no, it's not going anywhere, it's still in the acute phase and it could stay in that acute phase for years. And after 30 days, it's called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so Irene and with Carly leaving, we realized in our relationship, she knew what I did. And she came to me and said, um, you know, I have PTSD and I think I think all parents who, who have lost their child, the child transition, and it, it seems to be true. Yes, it is true because um, the trauma of it, if it doesn't leave, if the recurring thoughts and the emotions and the sadness and the sleep dis and all the symptoms of PTSD that stay with you for a long time is at the very least unhealthy because if that stays with you a long time um, physically, it's gonna compromise your health. So it's so important to heal the trauma of it. You know, grieving is a, a life process. You know, we're never gonna be happy and we're gonna grieve as much as we love and that'll, you know, ebb and flow. And it will, we'll be able to have a normal life without the trauma, but the trauma needs to be healed. So EMDR is one of the most beautiful ways of integrating both parts of the brain processing it, digesting it, assimilating it, and allowing us to uh, breathe again and at least go into just our normal feelings of mad, sad, glad, hurt, scared, whatever feelings come and go, we wanna go back into the center of peace. So like Dr. Um, Alan Bakken, in my process of doing EMDR with people, and people have all ranges of traumas, um, Several times, if the trauma involved a loved one who crossed over, several times they'd be in connection in my 90 minute period of EMDR. That's what it is, a 90 minute session time. And in that 90 minute time, um, I've had a few people who connected with the other side. And as a spiritual person, to me, that's, you know, that's normal, you know, that's great. And it was beautiful. And I never took it much further than that, as if that, that's how it's supposed to be. You know, they healed their trauma, they were able to connect and hear something from their loved one. And a great example of this is after 9-11, when I did a support group for people in my area, New Jersey, who were all traumatized, I didn't know what to do. In fact, my son called me up and said, Ma, you gotta do something. It's like, 9-11, you know, what do I do? So I had a support group. And one of the ladies, I offered a free, two free sessions of EMDR for people who were suffering from the 9-11 PTSD. And this one young lady um, who allowed me to talk about it, she had lost her fiance on the plane that hit the tower. So you could imagine the thought in her head of her fiance just, you know, in the fire. That's, that's, that was her vision and she couldn't get it out of her head. So as we did EMDR for that 90 minutes, towards the end, she got very calm and, and she told me he's here. And he told her 
that not only did he not suffer, not to worry, he didn't want her thinking about that picture of the plane hitting the tower. What he wanted her to think of is that the truth, before the plane hit the tower, all of the angels took all of the people and guided them to the afterlife, beautifully, peacefully, joyfully. And he wanted her to smile about it because nobody suffers. And that helped me <laughs> as much as her. And I'd like to share that with everyone because it's so important to realize no one suffers. Even in the worst situation, we're taken care of. So I got involved with repair and reattachment grief therapy when Carly transitioned and my sister was up every night, right? Sleepless nights with PTSD, looking for, I found Dr. Hogan's book. She, she would, I think you mailed it to me. So I read Dr. Hogan's, uh, Dr. Craig Hogan's book and I read just about everything in your library and more. Um, and one of them was, you know, Rochelle Wright's repair and reattachment and Irene wanted to have the treatment. So I called Rochelle and we, because we're colleagues and similar backgrounds, we had a great connection and we became friends. And Irene and I both went out to Seattle, Washington where Irene had her session and I trained that weekend. It was October, 2014, right on my birthday actually. Right? And my experience in the training blew my mind. I thought I've, I've had my mind blown a few times in energy psychology where things happen quickly. Um, but with the repair and reattachment, I was a little, you know, shy and not confident and didn't know if I could do it. Um, and when we paired up, um, I use essential oil. So I brought my highest potential, I think in vision, I use some, but just to help calm and uplifting and amplifies the energy in a nice way. And so we anointed with Envision and we made an intention as we do to have the highest good from this experience. And one round of eye movement with my partner who is a, a trained psychotherapist license. Um, Rochelle had that, and I, I was licensed. So everyone who went was licensed because of the EMDR, like Dr. Hogan said, it can have serious side effects if you don't know what you're doing. And it, if in time, every therapist who's trained in it learns how to guide people safely to shore. So I did one round with the therapist and she said, I don't get nothing. And I was like, all right, let's go with that. Just think about nothing, you know? And the second eye movement was like, boom. She was um, wanted to contact or she wanted to work with um, her sister's fiance who died in Vietnam 45 years earlier. And the fiance, it was a, it was a touching story that her sister was pregnant. Her parents didn't like the boy. He was a Mexican American and they didn't like him. And so they didn't let her talk about him. And he was away in Vietnam and he was supposed to come home and they were, she was getting ready. They were going to have, she was making her dress for the Engage, engagement party and the, the marriage and um, the two days before he was supposed to come home he was killed in in Nam so she wanted to connect with him and I thought that that's interesting isn't it but he was there he was and she knew him as a child see she was in junior high and her sister was a senior in high school and she loved this guy because he made her he made his sister take her on all their dates, which her sister wasn't happy about, but he loved her and she, he was like her kid's sister. So they had a real strong bond. And when he came through, he said something like, oh, it's nice to see you've grown up. <laughs> and she was like, later she said, I'm glad he didn't say I got so old. <laughs> but he, he had all these messages for her that um, why he didn't come home that he in Nam realized his personality had changed. He had suffered so much uh, horror stories and pain and his personality had changed from a, a, a you know, just a happy go lucky guy. He knew he was gonna have problems and if he came home, he would ruin her life is what he told my partner in this session. And so he told her a lot of messages that something important about repair and reattachment therapy to know is we expect the unexpected. And when you get these messages that are so unexpected, you know it's the afterlife talking. So what repair and reattachment therapy does is 
spend a whole day with Alan Botkin's induced communication. It's a two hour, if I'm right, a two, a two sessions of 90 minutes EMDR and you get what you get. So when Rochelle expanded it to have more communication, it was also to repair. It was first called Guided Afterlife Connections and she changed it to Repair and Reattachment Grief Therapy. So it sounds more clinical, but it's the same thing, but it does repair our, our relationships and it helps uh, us reattach to our loved one in a new way because we still have a relationship. It's just a different relationship now that we need to communicate with spirit on the other side. So with Rochelle's method, it's a full day. It can be five, six hours. And we spend the whole time honoring our loved one, taking, collecting all the memories, the experiencer, not the client, the experiencer experiences a full day of talking about their loved one like they've probably never done before, being able to talk about every memory and every, every situation that comes to mind. And we're building the energy, we're building the energy, we're connecting because just talking about it, just the thought field of energy to energy, thought to thought, soul to soul. And by the time we collect all these memories, we're able to see where the trauma is. And so we number the memories as the, as the facilitator, I number every memory and highlight all of the traumatic memories. And we take a break, you know, after about two, three hours, we have a little break of lunch or, and then we come back and target those memories that are disturbing and process them with EMDR and help reduce all the trauma about it because the trauma is what prevents the connection. So once the trauma is healed and all that shock and lock is released from the nervous system and we find this peaceful place where we can connect, that's when it happens. And I've done several and Brian will speak about his experience with it. Um, I usually get um, about the time the connection is beginning, the whole room changes. I can feel it, I can see it. Um, it gets lighter, I can feel a glow around the person. And now that we're doing it online, it's even, I think more intense for me <laughs> because I just feel this, I hear this whir and I, I feel the experience and I know a connection is gonna happen. And the next thing I know is someone's closing their eyes and listening. And um, so I'd like Brian to maybe share uh, what's happened. Brian's been, you've been a long time helping parents heal board member and helper and work so hard for, in your grief and growth podcast and you do so much good work that um, Brian offered, we both helped each other because he helped me do a demonstration for other therapists that I trained. So he was the guinea pig <laughs> for the demonstration. And uh, how was your experience, Brian? Um, it was it was as you described it, Judy. It was it was really um, you said it's a whole day of honoring your loved one and, and and building that energy and getting to talk about them for just hours, you know, and, and under uninterrupted and building that that connection. So that was really great. Now I was uh, at the time we did this is about five years after Shana had passed, uh, a little over five years. And I'd done a lot of work. I've done a lot of, you know, work with various ways. I've had medium readings. I've done some work in, in terms of trying to heal some of the trauma. So I did it as a, as a demonstration so we could help, you know, show what the technique was. But what I realized going through, as you said, and, and individually numbering each of the traumas and then kind of ranking them and going through them, it was interesting because with the work I'd done before, some of those, they weren't as bad. But there was something that I didn't even realize that was traumatic to me that came up while we were doing this. And so when we did the technique with that one, it really impacted me a lot more than I thought that it would. So that, that idea of going through and inventorying the traumas, I think was really, uh, really good. I've also tried several times to facilitate it like after death communications with, with Shana. And frankly, they haven't really worked all that great for me. Uh, I know they work really, really well for other people, but I had an unexpected experience, you know, with actually seeing Shana and hearing Shana. Uh, during that during that time, which was said so that was unexpected for me because I've never had anything like that before. So um, yeah, it was it was just really um, 
it was really healing and, and the way that you do it, I think you, you, I think you bring your own thing to it. I know Rochelle took Alan Bakken's and I think it improved on that and the way you do it, I think it improves even on that. So I'm looking forward to other people having that training. So it'll be available to everybody. And wasn't there something unexpected in your session that uh, Shana said to you or something that? Yeah, there was. Well, there were a couple things that were unexpected. One was there was a, a trauma that um, that I didn't realize was traumatic to me. We were going through all the things that we went through and I was and there was something that triggered. So working in that was very helpful. You know? So that was one thing. And the other thing was, yeah, I did have an experience of actually hearing Shana talk to me and, and seeing her, which I had not had before. So um, yeah, that was that was to me, like I said, unexpected, and that was one of the, th the one of the beautiful things that, that came out of it. Well, I I just want to say first of all, um, there are a lot of things that are being said in the chat bar about you, Judy, and I'd like to read them very quickly uh -oh. because um, <laughs> what you said it, it was very profound. First of all, Beata is saying I love Judy. She helped me so much. I am now doing EMDR. Catherine is doing, I love Judy too. She is a loving and gifted healer. Joyce is saying, oh, that's beautiful. She was saying that when you were talking about the plane about to crash and the angels coming and getting all of the passion passengers. I think that for all of us, it's just so meaningful to hear that because that is something that is really important for all of us to understand that our kids never suffered. None of our loved ones suffered before they transition and Hearing that is is so is so soothing to is so healing. Um, so Maggie is saying, "Wow, knowing about that plane." Catherine is saying, "Wow, that image of the angels taking the folks off the plane is a beautiful vision." And um, Maggie is saying that she loves the way that you spoke, uh, saying, "I love." Uh, we grieve as much as we loved, um, which is true. I think that that's um, understandable. That it's hard to get over the passing of a child because we love them so much, obviously, but knowing all of these important things about the fact that they did not suffer and that they're in a wonderful place, as Craig is saying as well, is just so healing to us. Um, and Tina is saying, this is wonderful. This is also true. I've just had EMDR two weeks ago, communicated with my daughter, and she gave me an incredible gift. The last two years have been horrendous, mostly, but I feel so different now. And um, I am fascinated with Brian's account because I've known Brian since the beginning, pretty much the beginning of his journey too. Um, and I have seen, I think that in the very beginning, you were already very, very um, far along the path though um, to healing. And I was impressed with that, but you've done so much with this journey and helped so many people along the way. And obviously, Brian was uh, one of the um, initial Helping Parents Heal online facilitators, and he's also a caring listener. He and uh, Ty, his wife, are both caring listeners. So if anyone needs to talk, he's a great person to listen. And um, I, I also want to just... Um, and Anna is saying, this is a wonderful presentation. Would love to do EMDR. How do we schedule a session? Could you possibly, Judy, explain a little bit about the difference between Xiaomi healing that you do and the EMDR is to, um, to, to try to uh, let people know about what to expect if they come to your session on Monday, for instance, which is free of charge. That would be really great so that people understand. Yes. Um I do not do EMDR per se in the healing session because that's a one-on-one -on -one and requires a lot of attention. As I said, there are side effects and we don't want to do that in a large group. But the reason um, I started the group is because I trained in a, a method called flash technique. And that's a very quick way that has no side effects and it's you only focusing on a positive image. I was just explaining this to Hogan today. Um, my session on, on Monday and the first Monday of every month now, it's a two hour session. So it's broken down into three phases. 
The first phase is we're going to develop a sacred space to heal. We do a little breathing and relaxing and energy centering and a meditation to create this sacred space. So the energy is calm and quiet. And then we move into the flash technique where I ask everybody who comes to bring just one memory that's disturbing. We don't focus on that memory. We put it in a container. Um, you, all you, have to, you don't even have to think about it. Just, you know, you can think about how you feel if you thought about it, you know, and rate it on a zero to 10, that zero to 10 sud scale, subjective units of disturbance. So in that second part of flash, you bring the disturbing memory to put in a container and bring a positive focus, a positive memory. It's called a PEF, a positive engaging focus. So bring something that really makes you smile and light up like a Christmas tree, you know, because you want to stay engaged in it. And with that, we do bilateral, like Craig was saying, tapping on the, the legs, or we can do a butterfly hug this way. I don't do eye movement, but, you know, just... Any, any tapping on the body from below the eyes, anywhere on the body, will have this crisscross effect when you're tapping. You tap the left shoulder, the right brain lights up, the right shoulder. If it's eye movement, it's right in the brain, eye to eye, going left to right. So we do the below and we tap and think about the positive right? And, and blink. So flash is about tapping and blinking, tapping and blinking. And in that amazing little experience developed by Dr. Phil Manfield, um, the, when we check in the container, usually the disturbance is, has decreased significantly. So we make sure that everyone is, their level went from a 10 to at least a five or less. And then the third sh uh, shift or the third um, piece of the, the session is I do energy work with you we, that I learned from evolving thought field therapy and my own Shiomi therapy, which is bring that disturbance down to a zero, a one or a zero, and then we can shift it in what I call a magic circle. And we take that energy, that memory that's in the circle, and we take it through a what I learned and trained with a native Amer um, American Indian shaman, Grandma Michi, she was a medicine woman. She taught me about the medicine wheel and how to use that vision in a healing journey. So I've incorporated that. You know, Shiomi's a little mix like chicken soup, you know, the best of all these little techniques that I put together in a way that helps shift the energy from a negative to a positive. And when it's all shifted and we, it's kind of like a vision quest. We give it to God in whatever way you wanna call the source of all, the creator, the, the highest power, whatever concept you have, we give it to that highest power, the, our memory. And it comes back to us in a positive vision. And then we take the positive vision that comes back to us and we kind of lock it into the brain with eye movements and pressure points. So we're left with a, a beautiful feeling that the change from the negative to the positive or disturbing to you know brilliant and peaceful. And we lock that in and then we, we meditate on that during the month till the next meeting. And so some people, you know, I, I don't ask for your negative, um, or a disturbing memory that's yours to put in that container. And it's all shifted. So we honor the memory, you know, it's not that we're saying go away. It's no, 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 we can't destroy it, but we can shift it from a, a bad feeling to a peaceful and even a good feeling. And that's what happens. We're shifting from the, the negative to the positive in that two hour period. So, that's so wonderful. Far, and so you're doing this on Monday, which is very exciting because it's nice that we're having this meeting right now and people can look forward to that. I wanted to also just mention that Dr. Craig Hogan is the originator of the AREI conference and he probably you might already know him through those conferences, but he is one of the leading experts on the afterlife. And um, I feel so grateful to have him here and he will be coming out with a book uh, soon that's 500 pages. And I was going to ask you, Craig, would you mind just telling all of the parents here, as you did to us, 
about the topic of your book because um, with this plane, uh, you know, with the angels coming and taking all of the people off the plane, mm -hmm. I think that parents love to hear about, uh, they'll, they'll love to hear about what your topic is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy to talk about it. What I'm doing is uh, this book will be about the whole process from the time that our higher selves decide to incarnate a soul through the time when the soul is planning what's going to be happening in this lifetime into growing up as a child on the Earth's plane, then to rejecting everything that you learned because everything you learned as a child was wrong in this society today, and then becoming the person that you can become during this time. It also has a, information about communicating with our loved ones who are on the other side. And then from there, it goes into the graduation from what happens just before the person graduates, what happens while they're graduating, and then what happens immediately after, and then the life in the afterlife. And then the final chapter is about what happens after the life after this life what uh, the process is from there on. And one of the things that I have in the book, incidentally, from several sources, I think a half dozen sources, is their reassurance that no one feels pain in the passing. No one feels pain. And one of the examples that's in the book is of a man who is speaking from the other side. He's telling about this from the other side. And he said when it, he was in a car with his daughter, and as they were driving down the road, a, a semi careened out of, the, out of nowhere, slammed into their car. But what happened was they were taken, he was taken up out of the car before the, the collision. She was there, he held her hand, they both rose up and they were up high enough that they actually watched the, the collision below. So they were far, they were taken out long before the, the event happened. So at, at the point at which we know that it's our exit point, at the point, we all have an exit point. So when our exit point has come, there's no reason to go through the pain. So we're taken out of the circumstance and uh, are then able to go on. Uh, and even someone who's in a coma and is not going to return, the body's still there, but the person is gone. The person is already on the other side. Uh, the, the body then will react to things, and the body goes through the collision, and the body goes through uh, having the, the traumas when they're in a, in a coma. But the person is gone, and because we are only spirit. That's the earth plane is a spirit plane. We're, we're spirits on the earth's plane is a spiritual plane. And all we're doing is going to another spiritual plane. And so we are never hurt. Our spirit is always whole. And we do go through the, the traumas during this lifetime. We go through the struggles and we go through the problems that we have. And, and it's like going to the dentist though. We go to the dentist because we want to become well. And we go through that that pain and, and the trauma of, of being in the dentist's chair. But we realize that once we've done that, then we're going to come out of that. And when we come out of that onto the other side, it's going to be a joyous time because then we're not going to have a toothache. You know, and we're going to be whole and, and we're going to be with the, the people that we love. So when, when our spirit, when our souls are looking down into what's going to be happening in this lifetime, our souls realize that, our souls see that. And that's the reason that, that they're able to plan things that are difficult for us, real challenges and real tragedies. Because they realize the fact, that our souls realize the fact that this is going to be a short period of time. We're going to go through those events in our life. We're going to learn from them and then we're going to come to back together again. So in a blink of an eye, then we're all going to be back together again. Uh, the other thing that the book shows, the people, after they've made the transition, then the first thing that happens if they have had a death in which they have been for a period of time they've been ill or they've had a difficulty for a period of time then they wake up on the other side so they they come out of it and wake up there and when they wake up all of the the people they loved are around them their pets are around them the pets will be among those who will come up and be the first to greet them and that is inevitably, that is always what happens when they go to the other side. Now, somebody transitions very quickly 
then they may not be ready for them to transition, but there are what are called deliverers. And the deliverers are kind, uh, they are the, the souls that the people see in a near-death experience that's with that overwhelming love that they don't want to come back in the near-death experience because it's such a wonderful, wonderful world. The wonderful love that they feel, that's what the deliverers bring to them. So everybody, when they, they come to that point after you get through the process of, of just being in whatever the circumstances are that you're in, then the wonderful, glorious period of time happens immediately after. And, and people say that they are overjoyed, that they find out that they're still alive uh, after they come to that point. And then, but then their first concern, uh, always the first concern, is about the loved ones they've left behind. So that very quickly takes over. So after they realize joyously that they're, uh, they, they are still alive, then they want to come back. They want to communicate. They want to see the loved ones that they have left behind. So they do come, they do, do come back and they do come back very quickly. Uh, they, many of them go to their own funeral uh, and uh, they will come back and they're looking forward to communicating. And it's at that point that it's on our responsibility to reach out to them and communicate because they are anxious to communicate. One of the things that they say over and over again is that they wish that people would communicate more people must communicate with them because they need that for their own healing because they are they're healing on the other side as well they're healing from the things that happened during their life that might have been difficult uh, they're healing from the fact that that we're grieving on this side and that grief then is something that they want to heal they they need that they need to feel that so if we can communicate with them if we can have regular honest open communications with them and not only that we say things that we'll get them back when we realize how to do that then that's therapeutic for them that's important for them they need that and so they tell us over and over again from the other side please tell them to communicate with us don't give up on us we're with, with them uh, and you'll get a sense of presence the sense of presence is a re very real sense it's just a, like seeing and hearing and the sense of presence is uh, the, the sense that you get, you might get a tingling uh, on, on one side of your body, or, or you might just all of a sudden have the feeling that they're in the room with you. It, that sense is a real sense. And you can take advantage of that and stop for a minute and just have a conversation with them. All you have to do is relax, say something to them, and, and the first thought that comes into your mind, without thinking about it, without judging it, the first thought that comes into your mind is their response to you. And then if you respond to that immediately, then they'll respond. And it happens very quickly. So the, the dialogue should happen with immediate responses, without any breaks between them. And you can have a conversation with them. And it's a wonderful experience and they need to have it on where they are. We need to have it where we are now. We just have to keep up that, that relationship that we have with them. So that's part of what the book is about. It's, it has as everything that I have learned over 575 sources and they're all people from the other side who are speaking to us. So they're through mediums and physical mediums, mental mediums, trans mediums, and they're, we're bringing this information about what actually happens all the way through the process from deciding to incarnate through having the graduation and life afterwards. That's amazing. And I just want to tell you that everyone is so uh, comforted by everything that you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. Craig Hogan is a wealth of information on the afterlife. He is wonderful, um, fascinating, how comforting to listen to you, Dr. Hogan. Thank you, Craig. That is a beautiful explanation. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, Catherine is asking about an experience with Alan, uh, Alan Bodkin, um, who recommended a therapist, and she did two 90-minute uh, sessions um, after the two days. The pain was supposed to go away. It hasn't gone away. Um, I, I'm just wondering, um, does it sometimes happen that way? And possibly I'm just suggesting that Catherine should attend Judy's session on Monday. I think that that would be a wonderful thing, but, um, she has done this twice, I guess, at six months interval. So, um, I, I would assume that it was a trauma that was pretty important, but, um, I don't know if you were able to read it in the chat box yourself, but um, if if you have any suggestions for Catherine, that would be great. Or maybe Judy does. Yeah, I'm sure Judy would. 
Okay, yes. if, you, well, if you could answer them. It's what we were saying before about the difference between Dr. Bakken and Rochelle Wright's method, mm -hmm. because staying with, not just breaking up two 90 minute sessions, but staying with the process the whole day and, and processing out the trauma is really important. Um, if you go to repair and reattachment grief therapy.com, is that the correct? Yeah, site? right. Mm -hmm. Re repair, repair reattachment. And reattachment. Uh, Repair and reattachment. Just, just, re, re, uh, just repair and reattachment .com. Repair and reattachment .com. Yes, that <laughs> will give you a list of certified therapists, trained therapists all over the country. Okay, because okay. we can't do it ourselves. <laughs> I yeah. can't split myself into a hundred pieces, but that's why we're training other therapists. And Rochelle has a group of therapists already trained on mm -hmm. repair and reattachment .com. And also Emdria, E M D R I A dot org. Emdria dot org has a list of certified licensed trained therapists throughout the world. So there's plenty of therapists. And my my um, suggestion is don't go to the first person just because they're there. You know, always check two or three people, three or four if you need to. Spend some time, get a feeling for it. And if you don't like the feeling you get, there's plenty other therapists who are trained and, and plenty excellent, wonderful therapists, as well as some that you know aren't as comfortable with it. And there's, I know a lot of EMDR trained therapists that are not comfortable, they dabble in it. You mm -hmm. don't want a dabbler. You want someone who really knows what they're doing, has experience and time and recommendations from other people. They, people who are, do it well have no problem saying, you know, they have a list of testimonials and clients who, who had success with them. So, you know, make sure you're with someone that's a match and that you resonate with, and then, then you'll have success. That's yeah, and the EMDR psychotherapists don't all do the induced after death communication or, uh, or the repair and reattachment psychotherapy. So. Uh, you can't expect it that you can walk into their office and say, hey, I'd like to talk to my, my loved one right. because they're not, most of them are not going to do it. They are not going to be in that tone of mind. And, and so don't expect that. But, uh, but they certainly are wonderful for PTSD and for trauma and for uh, handling grief, helping to handle grief, mm -hmm. those kinds of issues. Good. I, I have a question because you were talking about the fact that our kids attend their memorials or their services. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Doris is saying, what happens when you could not do a memorial because of COVID? Could you maybe answer that, Craig? Just yeah, the, the actual ceremony is perfunctory. It, it, in other words, it, the actual ceremony is not what's important. What's important is the feelings of the people who are involved. And that means that, that if you didn't get a chance to go to the funeral, if you didn't have a funeral for some reason, that's not what's important. That, that child knows every person they are not only able to feel uh, what they, you feel, but they, they're able to get every thought, every thought you think, every feel, feeling you have, they get that and they get it in spades. They get it emotionally. And so all of the love that you have for them at that moment when you might've had a funeral, all that love from all of the people is coming to them. So they're receiving it. They're, they're having everything that they need to have. They're going to the funeral just out, out of love for everybody. And their fervent wish that, that we wouldn't grieve so much. They fervently wish that we wouldn't grieve so much. And so they wish that they could, they could say, listen, I'm here, I'm fine. Uh, and, and we're always going to be sad. Uh, the, the grief never goes away entirely. There's always the sadness, but we can manage it better. We can make it will become more stable as we realize the fact that they are very much alive and, and they're with uh, the other children on the other side. Everybody know that, that the, all of the children get together. So <laughs> <Are you? laughs> the, the, all of the children get together. We, we get that through uh, Sherry Pearl, Sherry Pearl's work. She's done a lot of work with, and, and the children come together. Her son, Danny gets together with other children. And uh, so that you can expect that they will, when they come through, they may come through with somebody else, some other person, uh, some other son or daughter. And they say, I, I tell mom I'm doing fine. You know, and and uh, so they'll give that message from other people. But they're they're over there together and they're having a wonderful time. They just worry about us grieving. That's yeah. beautiful. And of course, they are completely fine. We're the ones mm -hmm. who, uh, who need to heal and to move forward. And um, 
And we're also doing this together. So I know, mm -hmm. Craig, that all of our kids have gotten us together in this group, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. They, they draw us together because they're already friends. And um, I, I would like to just, um, we have about four more minutes. So I would like to maybe just um, ask you if you'll come back and talk about your book when you have um, published it, because so many people are talking about the fact that they would like to read it. Um, what is the time frame for the publication of the book? Well, it's at the proofreader now, so I would expect it to go out within a month and a half, month to month and a half. So well, I hope to get it out then. That's but very I'm, exciting. And I'd I know- Love to come back. Well, good. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then Judy, um, I, I just want to reiterate that you're going to be with Irene again on Monday, as you have been doing. I think this will be the fourth time that you've done this. Is that correct? Oh, I, it last May. It'll be a year in May. Oh, a year. Mother's oh, Day is when I started it I'm last sorry. May. Yes, it's been a lot longer than that. Excuse <laughs> me. Oh, well, sorry. yes, this is wonderful that you're doing this. And so um, please be sure to join Judy uh, and, and Irene on Monday if you would like to. And I'm sure that you'll get a lot out of that. Um, I also, uh, in the three minutes that are left, I'd like to ask Irene to just tell a little bit about her own session, if that's possible. Could you just explain what happened for you? Sure. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit because I suffered tremendous post-traumatic stress after Carly's passing. Uh, her diagnosis, her illness, the day she passed, everything associated with it, um, I really could not function. And it was just about, I guess about a year and a half after that I did this session with Rochelle. And it was just an absolutely incredible experience for me. I didn't realize all of the traumas that I had in my life, how trauma builds upon trauma. And when we went through the trauma work, how I would describe it is those memories will always be painful memories, but they lose the charge. Mm -hmm. I would hear an ambulance and it would literally take me into my closet where I would spend time and just roll up in a ball and rock back and forth thinking about the ambulance and when Carly was taken to the hospital the day she passed. And now if I hear an ambulance, I'll think, I hope that person will be okay. Mm -hmm. So it still isn't a pleasant thought, but the charge of the trauma is released. Mm -hmm. And I had an eight hour session with Rochelle, which was just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Carly stepped into the room and Rochelle said she could see just this aura around me and she just told me, she's fine. We've been together for lifetimes. We'll be together again. And that this life is just the blink of an eye. So please, mom, live your life. Enjoy your life. Be happy. And it just, it changed my life. And okay. it was after that that I met Elizabeth, became involved with Helping Parents Heal. And I can tell you all, honestly, I miss her every second of every day. But I live a joy-filled life. I love my life. I have met people that in this group and through Helping Parents Heal and, and everyone else through Craig, through for everyone. It's just amazing what my life has become, the collateral beauty, the wonder of it all. And I just wish that for everyone. I hope everyone can get to that place. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And people are saying, wow, powerful, Irene, so wonderful. Um, this is wonderful, Irene, thanks for sharing. Uh, it, it, it is really amazing to think that you were able to shed all of that hurt that you were feeling and be able to do all of the things that you've done, <laughs> organize a conference and organize a second conference that didn't happen, but is going to. So um, anyway, but thank you all for being here. Um, it, it was really such a healing meeting. And I truly appreciate your explanation of, about what our kids go through and what they're doing now. It's just wonderful. I think that the takeaway is that we should all be sure to be listening for them and speaking to our kids as well uh, yep. because they love that. 
And um, thank you all. Uh, Irene, have you unmuted? Yes, everyone's unmuted. So please unmute, unmute yourselves. So please say, say thank uh, you. goodbye say and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for being here, Brian. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you, Craig. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Yes. Bye, Bye, Brian. Good to see you again. Thanks, good to see you guys. Thank you.